Welcome to the Metric Stack Podcast. Your hosts, Alan Villa and Lauren Thibodeau, will talk to founders, leaders, marketers, and more to uncover how they succeed with data. Whether you're struggling with data, reluctant to take the leap, or maybe you're a seasoned expert with years of experience, you'll hear stories from people like you who have used data to grow and scale their business. Welcome back to the Metric Stack Podcast. Today, we're joined by Aidan Brzee, co-founder and CEO at Fellow, a Teams hub for meeting agendas, action items, and feedback. Definitely a pandemic success story in the making here as well. I'm also joined by Lauren Thibodeau, and my name is Alan Ville. Aiden, super happy to have you on the show today with us. Yeah, this is exciting. I like that I get to be on a podcast as opposed to hosting it every time. Yeah, for sure. For those that don't know, Aiden does have a, a 70th podcast right now. You've got a series of podcasts. What's the name of it? So that everybody uh, it's can It's called find the it? Super Managers Podcast. So awesome. we, we focus on being like a more tactical resource for managers and, and leaders everywhere. Awesome. So go check it out. Definitely check it out. And what a perfect segue to our first question, Aiden. And great to see you and have you on the podcast. Can you just in your own words, tell us about Fellow in a nutshell and maybe what sparked the idea? Fellow is what we like to call a meeting productivity and team management tool. So it starts with helping you run more effective meetings and, and then extends into helping you manage your team. The idea was sparked really from when uh, my co-founders and I were at our last company. We originally, like when, when we were starting that company, it, you know, we bootstrapped it and, and kind of grew it over the course of time. And we would often use software tools to figure out how to do different things. So for example, if you know nothing about sales, but you use something like a Salesforce, you'll learn some things about sales, like the workflows that are used, things start as leads and turn into opportunities. And, and then sales, you, you understand conversion rates in different parts of the funnel. Uh, or if you use a tool like Clipfolio, I mean, there's like all the different you know metrics that you learn about and you're like, hey, I should really track those things. And so you know, the thought process for us was like, how come nobody's actually built a tool for managers and their teams? In the same way that Salesforce is for account managers, when you become, when you start to lead a team, like what tool exists for you? And and so that, that was kind of what led us down the path. Uh, but as we started digging in, what we realized that is that managers spend most of their time in meetings and unanimously they'll agree that for the most part, all suck. It's such a large part. It's the single largest category of type of work that people do in organizations. People do it in every organization, in every country, no matter what language you speak, no matter you know what kind of company you're in, everybody has meetings, but nobody's gone and solve the meeting problem. So the problem was, so we basically like took that lens and for managers and, and we just like started to hyper-focus on, on meetings. So let's take it from there. We'll pick up on Fellow and how it's grown and how it's really turning into an, a massive success. Let's start at the beginning. This isn't your first company. It's not your second company. You've always had a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit. Tell me about that. How did that begin? Like, who are you as a person? I don't know. I, I always maybe thought about starting companies as, as a way to do things that I didn't think were possible. I grew up in New York City, and the first business that I started was a snow shoveling business. Now, it's funny living in Canada saying that <laughs> New York City does get snow from time to time. And the thing is, like when they get snow, nobody knows what to do. So that's where we came in as kids, and we had a really horrible business model. We would go to people and we'd say, hey, we'll shovel your whole driveway for $5. It's the cheapest you know, snow shoveling that you'll ever get. That's our competitive advantage. It's a really horrible competitive advantage. And then you know that transformed into like, this is really hard and it doesn't really work all that much. So my brother and I, we, we looked at, you know, other things. We started day trading in the stock market for a while. We then started like a web development agency. We thought we could compete with Yahoo, which was like the dominant search engine at the time. So we started uh, like a search engine. Uh, and, and this was all like when we were in our teens, right? So this is even before university. And so we just, we've, we've just been doing things like that for a long time. None of them became, you know, huge successes, but we've just been used to starting things and uh, it doesn't work, start the next thing and then start the next thing. And then eventually some of them worked out. I love it. You're now co-founded another company again in the family. You're working with your brother. How do you make that work uh, when you're working day in, day out, things are going up, things are going down. It's a roller coaster. That's a good question. Like most people will say, hey, don't work with family. And, and I generally agree with that. It's probably not the, uh, in a world of infinite people, except for 
Uh, what's interesting is like Amin and I are extremely complementary. We'll watch the same movie and we will come out with completely different conclusions on what happened. We are as opposite as you can be from that perspective, super complementary. We have a lot of similarities that uh, we're both very stubborn, which is like a hard trait to deal with if you're both very stubborn and work together. So we started this company in the online survey space. Uh, we were building this product called Fluid Surveys. That's when we actually spent a lot of like very intensive time together. So we spent almost seven years building that company. And so we just like developed a, a framework. We learned that like if we're both responsible for the exact same thing, that doesn't work very well. But if we both have areas of ownership and we try the other person to like really own that area, then that works out really, really well. And then we also determined a philosophy around how to resolve conflicts. I mean, it's pretty simple. We, we have this thing where we ask each other on a scale of one to 10, how important is it for you for us to go your way? And, you know, if I'm like, you know, four and, and, and he's like an eight or a nine, then, you know, it's very simple. We'll, we'll go with him. But the thing is, you have to answer that question accurately. You can't say eight or nine every single time. That doesn't really work. Yeah. So I think like that, that's worked out really, really well. It just comes with a lot of trust. We both think very highly of each other, or I think he also thinks highly of me. <laughs> but yeah, so through that kind of procedure, it's worked really really well. And, and again, like we, we went at it. This is our third major company, five different products that we've worked together on. And, you know, as long as he will keep working with me, I will keep working with him. Love it. And so let's get into kind of your company days and, and shift gears a little bit and start to unpack the metrics. So let's start with bootstrapping. Back when you were doing that in the early days of Fluidware, what were some of the metrics that you paid the most attention to in those early days? I would say that like, I mean, you have to remember, we started that company in 2008, sold in 2014, which is a long time ago. Can you believe that's uh, six years ago oh. now, which is insane. But back then, I can't say that we were I'm almost embarrassed to say like how not data driven we were back then. Like we obviously, it's just like when I compare the way we are today versus the way that we were back then, it, it, it's night and day. You know, at a high level, the things that we did track uh, building the the survey company was we were tracking things like number of signups. That was a thing that we tracked every single day. We wanted to make sure that that kept going up. We tracked the conversion rate, how many people are converting into paid accounts. We track things like what kind of plans they sign up for. It, was it? I think like back then we had like the pro plan and the ultra plan. Uh, we looked at the different and, and the enterprise plan. We looked at the different mixes that existed. We obviously looked at traffic. We looked at sales per salesperson. We looked at churn rate. We also looked at some things like survey deploy rate, like how many people actually who created an account actually launched a survey. That's what I would say. Like it was a, a lot of our metrics were largely around top of the funnel things, you know, traffic to the website, search volume, you know, things like that. And, uh, and then conversion into, into paying customers, MRR. And uh, yeah, so very, very kind of like high level metrics that today I would consider unsophisticated. Well, that's great. And that's, you know, the evolution. In the early days, do you remember what were some of those clues or signals when you knew you had product market fit? Back then, I, I, I don't think we were even familiar with the term product market fit. So there, there was that. But I think like one, from a revenue perspective, when we kind of passed the million dollar mark, that's probably when we assumed that we had uh, product market fit uh, is, is, is what I would think. That's a good signal for sure. When you were going through that acquisition process and talking to different suitors and talking to different investors, what stuck out? I mean, you mentioned you weren't that sophisticated at the time. Were they asking you about metrics that were new for you? What did they care most about? During the acquisition process, so we, we got acquired by SurveyMonkey. So we were largely similar businesses. SurveyMonkey was a lot more sophisticated. You know, they're, they're a lot bigger as well. And so the, the sorts of things that they wanted to model, I think when uh, they asked us for a lot of raw data dumps, because they wanted to analyze the behavior that our users exhibited uh, versus the behavior that theirs exhibited. And they wanted to see like how similar 
similar it was. You know, for example, it was very interesting. Like when we were looking at our churn rate, and I'm not going to remember what what it was, but but the thing is, like a lot of people in the survey space tend to churn after the first month. And the reason is like, you're going to do a survey. And so you come in and you're like, I'm going to sign up, do my survey within 30 days, and then I'm going to cancel right afterwards, right? It's not evident that you're going to need a tool past the first month. So we generally had a, what I would consider to be a high churn rate. And we kind of always looked at that and was something that we weren't super proud of. But what we learned was SurveyMonkey had uh, similar behavior. So that actually didn't scare them off. But the thing that like we learned they looked at was they looked at of the ones that stuck around for three months, that's what they they started to measure their churn rate for that. So they kind of looked at it at, 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 as two funnels, which is like, you know, how many people make it past three months. And then from those that make it past three months, uh, what is the churn rate? And so that was like a very interesting way to look at things. I guess it's somewhat a proxy for activation, but it's interesting, like behavior has evolved over the course of time. So I think I'm not super current with exactly how they do things. I mean, you can go to their website and check it out, but I think like what's changed now is that if you get the annual plan, it's this same as if you paid for the monthly plan for only three months. It's something crazy where you might as well get the annual plan. And then what ends up happening is like, if you get the annual plan, you're likely going to have more surveys because then you think, well, you know, I already have it, might as well do this and that. You know, conversion rate w was a big one. Average order value was another big one. And then, you know, feature usage, we didn't have great feature usage data, but one of the things was we were much more enterprise focused. And so SurveyMonkey at the time was much more uh, small, small business focus and like didn't have a super advanced fe feature set. Again, this, this is 2014, yeah. six years later. So today they, they even recently rebranded and called themselves Momentive. So they are much more enterprise focused uh, today. Uh, but one of the things that they were interested in was of the features features that we have, which ones are being used the most by what kind of customers. Uh, and that was really interesting for them to have that fuel their roadmap. And like basically a lot of the things that we would end up building for them uh, after the acquisition on, on, on their platform. So yeah, th those were some of the things that, 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 that I remember from the process. Yeah. Fascinating. I mean, love that ability to really for them to gain insight from all of the data that you were collecting on users that you may not have known was actually great <laughs> in terms of the behavior that you were driving on those things. The other thing that struck me was, you know, you talked about almost segmenting that data, your churn data of the folks who churn before 30 days and the folks who stick around after three months, because that's super different, their behavior. Did anything you kind of learned in that first process, if we fast forward and start to shift and talk about Fellow now, where, you know, you've really raised a huge amount of funding already or significant amount of funding, your seed round, I think 8.5 million. Did anything you learned in kind of those earlier metrics discussions with investors come back to help you or maybe even hinder you as you were raising for a venture backed? This is interesting. And on the, the fundraising round, we'll probably have, uh, depending on when this gets published, there will be some new information. And so the that number will end up being a lot higher. But what I was going to say, yeah, so in terms of like the way that we operated, I mean, there's a, a few things to talk about. One is, you know, what investors look at at a seed stage startup, and then what investors look at at a series A stage startup, and, and they are very, very different. Yeah. Tell us about that. Do tell us because that'll be interesting. Yeah. So on, on the seed stage, primarily what you're looking at is uh, you're looking at the team. The team is probably the most important thing because at the end of the day, you might pivot or change things. But at the end of the day, the team is uh, is really important. So they look a lot at that. Um, but the other thing is like, is the thing that they're building, is it being used by customers? So do they have credible customers who, especially since they're early customers, they better love the product. Because if your early adopter customers don't love the product, that is not a good sign. So that that's a 
a big thing, which is like, how much do they love the product? But then the other thing is like anything you can tell from user behavior. So any sort of like patterns of usage, like, is this the sort of product that people log in once every two weeks? Or is it, you know, uh, once a month? Or is it every day? Is it on the hour? Like what kind of user behavior exists? So it's a lot of behavioral modeling around users. So those are kind of like the, I would say like the high level important things. Is this, is, is this a large enough market? You know, what are the competitors? What are the alternatives? Like th those are the things that people look at. Things change a lot when you are in, in the next stage looking for a series A, because now it's, it's much more like the assumption is your past product market fit. The assumption is like you figured out a lot of these things. You're at a significant sort of revenue level. So the things that people tend to look at are things like the burn multiple. So for example, for, at, for all the money that you spent in sales and marketing last month, how much new ARR were you able to add this month? And that's kind of like an indication that the bigger you become, you know, when you're a publicly traded company, that multiple should eventually get closer to one to one and maybe even one day you know, dip below one to one. But when you're a series A company, maybe that number, like a more healthy number for that, for example, might be closer to two or uh, or under two. Then there's a the payback period. Like this is a really important one and kind of an indication of, is this company ready to scale? So the question is from what you spend on sales and marketing, uh, and this is not just like what you spend on ads, it's, it's also salaries, kind of like very fully loaded what are you in total spending on sales and marketing? When you spend a dollar, how long does it take to get that dollar back? And so that's the thing. So for SaaS businesses, again, you know, the sooner that is, the better. If it's under a year, then that's amazing in general. And the reason is like, it's not like you can't make a business model work where say it's over a year, it's 18 months. But the problem is the longer it is, it's harder to, in some sense, to experiment. But the other thing is like, you've also got to ask the question of, remember, like you're a small-ish company, even at the Series A level. And if you want to be a global uh, and nowadays, it's you're not cool unless you can become a billion dollar company. And even even that, there's too many of them apparently these days. So if you if you're gonna grow to that level, you would assume again that your earliest customers, your first thousand or five thousand customers, I mean, like these are the early adopters, right? And so you know, the question is like, if your payback period is super long with with this early set, you know, the, the larger you get, you start to go to the fringes, and so you start to go after people who are more top of funnel, like maybe they're not as ready to purchase yet. All these numbers start to get worse. Like when you're a Series D company, I could imagine like. Like, you know, you should have these metrics shouldn't be as attractive as where they are, uh, say, in a Series A. But other ones are, yeah, cost of customer acquisition is an obvious one. Like, what is it cost to acquire customers? This is important at the Series A level. And the reason is that the uh, you basically want to have figured out how you're going to scale the business. So if you don't have a good understanding of some channels that work and like some channels that you're you're basically going to uh, use this newly acquired money in, in, in more of a growth round to, to use, then you're, you're, you might not be ready for that scale. Other things we look at are things like NPS. So this is a, this is always like a tricky one because when it comes to NPS, there are for a product like fellow, there's so many segmentations to this because there's the person who bought the product. There's the managers, you know, within the, the product that like use fellow in a slightly different way. And then there's like individual contributors that use a slightly different way. There's big companies and small companies, different sectors. So like th this can be sliced and diced in, in a lot of different ways. There's paying customers versus free users and, and so on and so forth. The other things that we look at are just virality, like how viral is the product when you get one user using the product within a company, like how many users will end up using it within that company. And then we also look at how active are users. And we, and we again, like we slice this in like 400 ways, but you know, at a, at a very yeah. basic level, how many people use it on a monthly basis or monthly active users, but also uh, we, we like to look at intensity. We, we look at DAU over MAU, which is, yeah. I guess, like something that, you know, has been around forever, but Facebook probably brought more to the investor landscape. But yeah, we monitor DAU over MAU very closely. And, you know, fellow is, I mean, use fellow for your meetings and for managers, you have meetings every day. Exactly. So you should, should be using be fellow 
every single day. So yeah, I mean, these are some of the things, there's many metrics, depending on the type of business you'll look at. But I think it's, uh, you know, what's interesting about like the way that we've built Fellow is that I think employee number three for us was, or the, the employee number two after the founders was a data scientist. You know, some of the lessons that we learned from building our last company was that data matters a lot. Yeah. And whoever is really good at, you know, figuring out, digesting their data, they're just going to be in a better competitive advantage. You'll end up making better decisions. You'll build the right features. So it was is really, really important. So we thought it was it was quite important for a very early employee to to be focused on this. That has put us in a really good frame of understanding what's going on in the product and, and what we need to build in, in future stages. How does that permeate throughout the rest of the company? Um, so when you're talking at all hands or when you see decisions being made by some of the other employees at Fellow, how does data come into play and, and uh, you know what's the culture around that? We're very, very data oriented. But the thing is, like, what we like to say is we are data informed, not data driven. And the reason is that it's always great to get data. But the problem is, until you are at an enormous scale, some of the slicing and dicing that you want to do, you're going to get to smaller and smaller data sets, depending on, you know, how deep you're going. And so anecdotes are actually really important. So we also like to talk to customers a lot. You know, a measure for us is like, are what customers are saying reflecting what what, what's in the data? Like, can we bridge those two sources of information? And if we can't, that means that we should dig a little bit further. So I think like that's a thing that matters. The other thing is that, yeah, I mean, data is some of the ways, for example, we, we make sure that data is reviewed. On a weekly basis, we have an asynchronous meeting that we call our weekly summary. And so what happens is all the leaders write a paragraph about what happened in their departments. Uh, but also we have a bunch of metrics. Everybody is responsible for grabbing those metrics and gathering them in one place. So we have a, a snapshot. And then we, we send out this information by email. I write a Sunday email to everybody. And so we have a bunch of this information there. But then the other thing that we do is we also review it in our weekly business review, which happens on Monday. So it's constantly being looked at. And then we also have uh, quarterly business reviews where we like evaluate each department. And, and we basically you know start with the metrics. It's, it's always starting with with the metrics and then dive into other initiatives after that. And this feels to me like one of these little podcast gems here. You know, you're in the business of making meetings more productive and more efficient. And, you know, here you are sort of proclaiming that, you know, every Monday you've got this meeting and it's got this set agenda. But, you know, the process ahead of that actually made sure that it was a productive meeting and that there's, you know, sort of con continuity with, with the way these metrics are presented. So anyways, I, think that's, I think that's great. I think that's something that more companies should be doing. For us, meetings are, are just workflows. What I mean by that is like a weekly business review is this workflow we've created so that, you know, on a weekly basis, a certain set of actions happens because we know that like when we do those things, then it leads to a certain outcome, which we use our weekly town halls is, you know, that, that's a workflow that we run. A QBR is a quarterly workflow. We run one-on-one -on -one meetings or, you know, workflows that we run. So each one of these things, we just think of meetings as workflows that drive work forward. Using these meetings, you can not only manage your team, but run your company. But yeah, and metrics are like a key, key, super important part of them. Uh, we've talked a lot about integrating, and we should do this one day, Alan, which is integrate Fellow and Clipfolio, because one of the things people do often during meetings is, is look at metrics. So it kind of makes sense for us to make that easy for people to do. We'll make it happen. I think that's perfect, right? Because you're absolutely right. Oftentimes you want to dive into something, right? In meetings, questions are asked. And those questions often rely on somebody saying, okay, I'll, I'll take an action and actually, you know, look at that data. I agree with you, Alan. These are podcast gems and the meeting gems that you've talked about are built right into Fellow in terms of templates and workflows that any manager can use to get better at running meetings, right? What you're doing with this podcast, but also what you're doing with the product is we're, we're basically doing the same things. We're, we're basically teaching people how to take best practices and use them to make 
better decisions, to run better teams, to manage the company better. So yeah. And again, like this is stuff that people have figured out. So why invent things from scratch? If you know that these are the sorts of metrics that people look at. And by the way, like we haven't even talked about benchmarks. This is a super interesting one. Actually, when we talk about investors, this is a funny thing because especially in SaaS, this stuff has become so standardized. I mean, you can go look up public company ratios and metrics everywhere. Uh, you know, you probably know the data sources better than I do. But the other interesting thing is now we have investors who sit on our board and they're like, you know what? That metric there, you guys can do way better. We're like, what do you mean? I'll introduce you to this person from this company and they're doing way better better at that than you are. You should talk to them. So this is, uh, it's very interesting, right? So if we start to speak the same language in terms of metrics, then it's very easy for us to be able to learn from from other sources as well, even if they are very different businesses. So I think, uh, you know, metrics kind of allow us all to speak the same language. And I think that is something that has changed over the past 10 years, in my opinion. I think people have become much more data literate, especially SaaS companies have shared a lot of data and a lot of know-how. Um, you know, a lot of the conferences that folks would attend, metrics was a, a fairly heavy talk track. So, you know, this is all good. This sort of standardizes and elevates kind of the learning and, and our ability to sort of benchmark and learn from each other. Completely. And let's actually take that into metrics for managers. We've talked about SaaS metrics. There's lots of good benchmarks. What about metrics that you would recommend aspiring leaders and managers focus on? What should they care about in terms of their own metrics? The larger your company gets, uh, the more you can do fun things around this. We're not thousands of employees just yet. So it's uh, it's a very different uh, sort of set that we would look at. I mean, things that we look at internally, I can talk about it in two ways because I think it's interesting. I'll talk about what we have seen, but what we do, but also what we see our customers do. And uh, some of what they do is, is, is quite impressive, especially at the large scale. But, you know, very basic ones are EMPS. Everybody should do an EMPS. It is enlightening. Uh, there's benchmarks for it. And then it can also help you improve your company over the course of time. For managers, what we like to say is managers should be rated on two things. One is how often do people say, you know, people that report to this manager, do they often stay with the company or, or do they leave? This is an important one. But also you don't want them to stay with that manager in theory forever either, right? You want them to be promoted and advance in their career. So that's another thing you want to track. When you're making offers, it's nice to keep track of like offer acceptance rates. You know, how well are you doing in your recruiting process? Because we're, we're such a meeting focused company, we like to look at meeting feedback scores, but also what percentage of meetings have agendas in advance. Ideally, that number should be very 100%. close to 100%. Um, but in terms of larger companies, they do some really interesting things because say you are a, you know, you have thousands of people working there. There's so many things that you can now track. You can track things like promotion rates and you can segment that from different sources like referral sources. Uh, how did these people get into the company? Like what managers did they report to? You can then look at things like performance scores because, you know, if people are evaluated on performance, you can take something as basic as a performance score and then measure it against, well, these people took this type of onboarding when they first came into the company. And like these other people didn't. Literally, once you start to think about employees as customers, you can then do all the things that we do for regular customers, but you could do it also for employees. But you just need more data to be able to do this. Otherwise, you rely more on anecdotes, which is which is also a very good way to do it until you know you become large enough that it becomes very data oriented. But yeah, large Large companies have people data science teams where like are just focused on all the different people metrics. And it's very interesting how they try and correlate performance, retention, advancement, and all of these things with all the different factors that could contribute to, to any of those outcomes. That's really insightful, actually, and, and a topic that we haven't actually covered very much with others we've spoken to. So thank you. Let's move on to then in a nutshell, because really Clipfolio's mission is about empowering users to succeed with data. So if we just gave you that phrase through your lens, Aiden, what does that mean, succeed with data? Data is just, a, I guess, like a reflection of how any system works. And to succeed with data for me is to have a really true understanding of 
what your business or your company or whatever you're working on looks like, like a true reflection of it. But part of that is to understand like what metrics you should be tracking because you can also get lost in the noise, track the wrong things, track vanity metrics, for example, but really understanding what things matter the most and then spending your time looking at the things that matter the most. And I think what you mentioned earlier resonated with me as well, this concept of data informed. I think data is really important and obviously, you know, nobody's a bigger fan than than I am, but the idea of bringing anecdotal uh, or experience data into play as well to sort of augment, that's where you get the emotional connection. You want the stories that make sure that the data is telling the right kind of story and that people can action it. Going on that and sort of down to our last question here, Aiden, and, and you know, you're a multi-time entrepreneur and, and founder. What is some advice that you would give to new founders and aspiring leaders? What would you leave them with? Instrument everything. <laughs> when you're building a product from scratch, sometimes you know, instrumenting is maybe not a thing that you think about early on. But depending on what kind of product it is, it makes a lot of sense to start doing that because if you start building that into the process of how you build products, then your life later will be much better. And you don't have to go through this crazy process of like becoming data oriented later on. So if you can start instrumenting things from the get-go, it's going to help you build a better company. I think that's great advice. Aiden, thank you so much for joining us. Aiden Merce, CEO and co-founder of Fellow. Yes, thanks so much. Great to have you here today, Aiden. If you enjoyed today's conversation about metrics and data, be sure to check out Metric HQ, our online resource for the metrics that matter most to you and your business.